Hello, welcome to ADAS's third lecture in our lecture series, Redefining uh, Heritage with Emma Rose Berry. Emma Rose is a partner at LDN Architects based in Edinburgh. Uh, they specialise in heritage architecture and transforming um, heritage buildings um, into its former glory and reintroducing that into the town and city context. Emma is going to speak to us through a few projects today for various different scales and what they're doing at LND and their heritage architecture. She is a partner and she's part of, she's a group leader on the uh, heritage working group for RIAS. Um, I'll pass you over now and you can begin the lecture. Hi, good evening everyone. Um, first of all, thank you so much Helen for the invitation to speak. Um, I'm delighted to be here to talk about my experience of historic building projects. And thank you to those of you who've joined or given up part of your Friday evening as well. So I'm Emma Berry, I'm a partner at LDN Architects. Um, this image here is our team. So we're around 40 staff members um, we're working on projects across the, the UK. We've got offices in Edinburgh and in Forest. So this is our Edinburgh office, which we refurbished for ourselves in Bureau Hapold. Obviously not there at the moment, um, hope to be back soon, all currently working from home, of course. So I've been with LDN for about nine years now. But the firm itself has been around for over 60 years. So it's got a long standing history and a, a very impressive collection in the archive. Um, this is Eden Court, which is the theatre in my hometown of Inverness. So it's always been a very important building to me. Um, and it's one of LDN's first public buildings and itself is now category A listed. That's a picture of the theatre. Um, so we work on a range of projects, but they often involve a historic building. Um, and I personally tend to work exclusively on historic building projects. I wasn't really taught about working with historic buildings at uni, so I'd never anticipated that it was a career path that I'd follow. Um, but once I graduated, I quite quickly started working with historic buildings and became absolutely fascinated by them and realised that's what I wanted to focus on. So a couple of years after passing my part three, I went back to uni one day a week um, and completed a two-year master's in architectural conservation while I was continuing to practice. Then I went on to obtain conservation accreditation and five years after that was upgraded to advanced level. So that's how I, I, I got to be involved in these types of projects and I'm going to talk through some of the projects of LDN that the LDN have completed in recent years, um, a couple of current projects as well, and they all take an entirely different approach in response to the heritage. So every historic building is unique and you know we don't take a one, one size fits all type approach. So I'll just, I'll briefly, before I head into the projects, run through some of the approaches that we take using the, the projects that I'm going to talk about. So, so sometimes it's about conserving as found. So this is New Hales House, which I'll, I'll talk about shortly, where things were literally conserved as found. Sometimes it's about an accurate restoration. This is also at New Hills. This is the Ducat, which I'll, I'll briefly talk about. Sometimes it's about revealing the different layers of the history. This is Riddle's Court, so a, a building on the Royal Mile in Edinburgh. Sometimes it's about technical research, and that's what we've been doing at, at the Hill House in Helensborough. We often do contemporary interventions. This is St. John's in Edinburgh. And then my favourite projects, complete transformations. So this is the, the Halifax Peace Hall, which I'll, I'll focus on later on in the presentation. 
There is one strand that runs through all of our historic buildings projects and it's what I really love and that's about the people, not just the people that use the buildings now, but the people that have used the buildings all through time. Um, and you know they, they, of, they often have absolutely fascinating histories um, with a range of different people that have used them. Um, and there, there's normally, this, this building for example has a group of friends who just absolutely love the building and use it is well used it's um well used by the community well loved it's is the proven hall in glasgow and it's is probably glasgow's second oldest building if not its oldest um it's located out at easter house and it's category a listed which means it's of national importance and one thing that's been really important in this project, which is what I really enjoy about these heritage projects, is the, the community engagement aspect of it. So it's a it's a 16th century building. Um, the, the block that you can see here, the stone block, is the north block, and that dates back, we think, to about the 1560s. And then the, the white block, which you can see here, which is rendered, we think was probably remodeled in the 18th century and there's a courtyard between the two. It's in really poor condition though. There's some really interesting vaults in the North Block, but they're they're suffering a lot from damp. Um, the, the roof of the North Block's been allowing water ingress for a number of years and you can see the plasters literally falling off the walls. The South Block is, um, we've done some opening up and we know that the South Block contains a lot of modern interiors, um, but you can see they're very tired and worn um, and it's in desperate need of a facelift. So the plan for this building, this work starts on site in January, which is really exciting, is that the North Block here will be converted, it's over two storeys and that will be converted for into exhibition spaces. And the South Block is for use by the Community Management Trust that are forming the Proven Hall Community Management Trust. And they're going to be flexible spaces. There's going to be a new welcome hub. It's going to be spaces for the community, spaces for schools to come and visit, learn about the building. Because community engagement has been so important in the project, we were, we were appointed to lead to community engagement projects as part of the, the main project. Um, there, there are some finials on the North Block. Well, there, there were finials on the North Block um, dormer, dormer roofs, which have been lost over time. We're not quite sure what they look like, but we've appointed an artist to, to come up with designs for new finials, which will be installed as part of the, the project. But in, in order to get to that design, the artist, um, we carried out workshops. These are with them. Um, young gents who are transitioning between school and college. Um, so they learn about stone carving. These are art students from a local college who spent quite a long time on a project researching um, some inspiration to come up with designs for the new finials. You can see that they, they made models um, and they came up with some incredible designs. And the outcome of that was that um, the, the artist has now created these designs which are going to be installed as, as part of the, the project and that there's a whole range of people who've been involved in the design of that. And the other community engagement project um, is for hoardings, so decorating the site hoardings. And so another artist has been employed and uh, she's been she's been working with local schools, local groups, and all the children have been drawing what Proven Hall means to them. And she's created a huge collage um, of, of all of these children's drawings of the building, um, almost like a timeline. It's really, um, it's really, it's quite something. Um, I, I didn't want to give away the designs because they're not going to be put up till January. So this is actually an example of a hoarding um, artwork that was done for a project, one of our Inverness projects, a boxing club refurbishment. Um, so just to give you an idea, a flavour of what <laughs> it might be, but it's, it's a lot larger. So it's been, it's been really great to work with the community and learn about the history of the building, what they love about the building and the fact that the community are, are really taking ownership of it um, and that it will be handed over to them at the end of the, the project. 
So I'll I'll move back to I'll I'll jump back now onto approaches and and talk through some projects. I'll maybe talk through five or six projects. I'll, I'm going to talk quite briefly on most of them, but maybe focus a bit more on the the Peace Hall project. So briefly on New Hills, um, I'm going to start with quite an extreme approach to conservation. Uh, so this is New Hills House, which is located in Musselburgh in East Lothian. Um, and New Hills was built in the late 17th century. It was enlarged in the early 18th century and it became one of the most important houses of the Scottish Enlightenment. It was owned from the early 18th century by the Dalrymple family and it's remained largely unaltered both inside and outside since then, which makes it really quite special. Property was taken into ownership by the National Trust of Scotland in 1996 and then LDN, who had a limited involvement in the property since the 1970s, were commissioned to develop proposals. And the main conservation work to the house was carried out in the 2000s. And an uncompromising conserve as found approach was taken. So an example is this handrail that I showed you at the beginning where it's literally you know, held together by cable ties to minimise any loss of historic fabric. Building services were renewed entirely in the house. Um, and that included installation of a sprinkler system as well. Really challenging to do all of that without disturbing all of these original intact finishes. Um, so you can see this, this is the, the dining room um, and all the finishes that you see are, are as, as they were found but really carefully services have been integrated behind them. So the house at the moment remains largely as it did during the 2000s, but LDN have continued to work at the estate ever since. Um, and my involvement's probably been in the last five years or so. Um, and most recently, the approach that the trust have been taking is quite different. Um, and the next project which I'm talking about is, is actually more of an accurate re reconstruction rather than a conserve as found approach. So this is the Duke. It had been in a derelict state for several decades and it was on the buildings at risk register. And for those of you who perhaps never seen a Duke before, um, they originally housed pigeons or doves and were really important structures in estates like New Hills um, because the birds and the eggs they were a source of food, droppings were a source of fertiliser. Um, earlier ducats tended to be a beehive shape but um, this ducats of Anita which you commonly saw lectern shaped ducats. So it was probably built in the sort of mid 18th century well, there are records of an earlier duke on the site, which it could be a remodel of, we're not entirely sure. And around 20 years ago, LDN had worked with a structural engineer, Elliot and Co, to install a temporary roof, which is what you can see here. And that was not just providing protection from the elements, but it was also providing structural support. So it was a very inexpensive, but really sensible way to conserve the structure for the future when funds became available to, to repair it. It's also, you can see, surrounded by derelict outbuildings which were in poor condition, so they needed to be demolished. Luckily, we had some historic photos of the Ducat. Um, often do a lot of research on, um, on historic building projects projects, looking in different archives, trying to find as many historic photos, drawings, information as you can about how they might have been originally um, or through the years. So luckily we had these, these great photos from the Canmore archive and you can see that it had a decorative dormer um, with flight holes and ledges. So we, we set about restoring the dormer to how, how it was originally. It was fully scaffolded, an independent scaffold to the structure. We worked really closely with the archaeologists, Adiman. These are some of their photographs. So they recorded all of the structure when this temporary roof was really carefully taken off because it was structural. It was an important sequencing of how it was removed. Um, and I mean, this is one of the things that I really enjoy about working with historic buildings, all the specialists that you get to work with, archaeologists, for example. And you can really learn so much. And these are some of their, their record photographs of the interior. So 
most of the nesting boxes were were intact. We did need to do some minimal structural repairs, but really quite a special little space internally. So here's the fully restored Duca um, and the NTS plan to install interpretation so that it can be accessed by the public. At the moment, it's at the entrance to their new play park. So moving on to Riddles Court, which was more a project about revealing the different layers of the building, revealing the different layers of history. Um, Riddles Court is also category A listed. Um, and it was built as the most prestigious 16th century townhouse in the old town of Edinburgh. Um, and it's been adapted and extended ever since. And it now comprises of a complex of buildings around two courtyards, which for those of you who know Edinburgh, stretch from the Lawn Market, which is at the Royal Mile, right down to Victoria Terrace. So we completed a £4 million transformation project in 2017, and it was a project for the SHBT. So for, for those of you who don't know the SHBT, that's the Scottish Historic Buildings Trust, an absolutely amazing organisation who breathe new life into abandoned historic buildings. Um, and the ambition with this building was to convert it into the Patrick Geddes Centre for Learning and Conservation, um, so learning events and office spaces. It was in really poor condition externally when we first came across it. Um, the exteriors had been conserved in the 1960s and in good faith at the time, but many of the repairs had been detrimental to the fabric, which is what we often see. And the interiors, um, they were really tired, but some of them were of really high significance. It was a really complex set of spaces, though. I, I remember when I first visited, it was just it was like a maze. Staircases absolutely everywhere. Um, and uh, it was it, it really needed some, some ordering um, and the, some major accessibility improvements. I think this is quite a good project to follow on from the talk that you had last week from Cathy because accessibility was really crucial to this building. Um, there'd never been any full access to the upper floors, so um, not everyone had ever been able to appreciate the heritage, only ever at the ground floor level. So it was absolutely crucial that the building was made fully accessible. So this was the this is the Victoria Terrace level, which comprised of a cafe, it was all very tired, it was very um, limited accommodation, limited um, support accommodation. And there had been a link to the upper level, but it had been blocked off. So this was just purely accessed from, from Victoria Terrace and not connected to the, to the upper levels at all anymore. So this is the level, the ground floor level, which was accessed from the Royal Mail. Um, and again, lots of spaces that were not well linked together, um, really poor support accommodation and no access to the upper floors other than via some pretty awkward staircases. Um, the first floor level had, has some of the most important um, interiors in it, but like I say, not accessible and very limited support accommodation, so difficult to actually use the spaces for any events. And then the top floor was a series of smaller spaces with really very poor access between rooms. So one of the first things that was really crucial with this project was to understand where the most significant spaces were. So where was the most important historic fabric that we really needed to leave untouched? And where were there spaces where we could maybe strip away layers that were perhaps detrimental to the heritage or of low significance? Where were the spaces that we could make interventions to make the building work better? So the yellow spaces are, are the key um, significant spaces. And the red is an area that we identified where we could insert a lift that would cover all floors so that all of the all levels could be accessible for the first time. And in that 
insertion, we were taking away you know, the least significant um, parts of the heritage. But what we did make sure we we, we did was that the, the lift was glazed and the lift shaft walls were the historic fabric so that while you're going up and down on your journey, you can see the different layers of history. So these are some sections through the building. You can see in the down takings, the, the red lines are where we cut out fabric so that we could insert this new lift lobby um, and this new lift. And then the yellow is the, 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 new, the new intervention. Some visuals of how the, the spaces can work. And then the, the changes that we made to the layouts. So down at Victoria Terrace, um, new cafe spaces were created, but with proper support and accommodation. And with stair and lift access to the upper floors. So the whole building was connected again. The, um, the ground floor level accessible from the Royal Mile. So there was a new reception space formed with new breakout spaces, which support the new, um, the, the biggest public room, uh, support and accommodation, toilets, tea preps, and this new lift lobby with, um, with the glazed lift. On the first floor level where you had the key historic rooms, you now had lift access to them all, um, proper fire escape as well, so you weren't escaping through different rooms and a new holiday let accommodation as well. I mean, what's really fundamental to the survival of these buildings is that they have a sustainable business plan in place. Um, and what one of the things with this building was, you know, holiday let accommodation. So there, there's a flat that's been created that you can you can rent out. And then the upper floors, which are primarily all office spaces. So for the SHBT and other office spaces that they rent out as well, all fully accessible, all completely resurfaced as well. Um, one of the fascinating things about this project, with the building being so old and having had so many different layers to it, was the things that we found on site. Um, we obviously do as much research as we can before we start on site. We do as much survey work, as much opening up as we possibly can. But inevitably, you will find things you don't expect. And that's what I really enjoy about working with historic buildings. It's what can make it really challenging, um, but it's part of the, the excitement of it all. Um, so on this project in particular, I said at the beginning there was so many different staircases, internal staircases, external staircases, staircases just going to single rooms. Um, and we found more during the course of the contract as well. Um, and they were retained and they were, um, they were made visible even though they weren't in use anymore. Um, we found some windows and the window to the right hand side there was just literally left as we found it, made safe. And it's in the lift shaft. So on your journey up the lift, you get you get to see this uh, random old window, which is quite fun. And this was probably the most amazing find. So um, the first image is what was a tired toilet block. You can see the second image, the cubicles have been taken down. Um, the third image is what we found behind the plasterboard. Um, the fourth image is when a ton of rubble came down the, the flue after the, the masonry came down. And you can see we were left with just the most amazing 16th century fireplace. I think the city archaeologist said he didn't know of any others like it in the city. Um, with intact with a bread oven, a salt press, and this is how it is now. And it was is part of a disabled toilet. Um, that's what it was. It was always intended to be a toilet, uh, an accessible toilet. So I think it's probably the most interesting accessible toilet in Edinburgh. Um, and yeah, well worth a visit if you're passing. Um, I think the other interesting find was this painted ceiling, which dates back to the late, late 1590s, I think, when the king hosted a banquet for the Danish royal family in the building. 
And uh, we we knew that there was this painted ceiling and we had plans to restore it during the contract. But we found even more of it um, under some modern plasterboard, which was just incredible. Um, and some of it's fire damaged and it's not been fully restored yet, but the trust do have plans to do that in the future um, when funds become available. So just, you know, lots of interesting finds um, and ones that can be a challenge to deal with but um, on site, but exciting at the same time. So of course the building was fully repaired externally as well. And there's a huge temporary roof that was erected over the building, which allowed the works to proceed regardless of the weather. And then it was reserviced entirely, which obviously for a building of this nature, you know, event spaces, it needs a lot of servicing and it's so difficult to do with these buildings. So a lot of the work that you see in these, these transformation projects is actually invisible because it's all been closed back up. Um, but it's one of the real challenges of working with old buildings. So here it is restored. So all of the exteriors were lime hurled again. This is the new entrance. That was a window that was enlarged to a doorway. That's the entrance hall. This is the lift lobby. So that's the glazed lift and the historic masonry lift shaft. You can see we've tried to reveal the different layers of the building, reveal the historic fabric where we can. This was the staircase that just led to one little box room, um, which we took away, but we obviously we kept the line of the staircase. And that glass floor that you see there, that has another one of the hidden staircases underneath it as well. So you can see down to it. What's the detail of the old staircase that was taken away? And then this is the, the first floor level. So again, you, know, you can see we've where partitions have been have been taken down. We've not repaired it, we've just showed the history. And then at, at the top, we did need to make an intervention to make the lift lobby work. So where we have made interventions, they're clearly contemporary in nature. So we're adding the new a new 21st century layer to the building. That's the, the rooftop. But then the, the significant rooms, the really important historic ones, they have been restored um, accurately. This is a, a painted ceiling which was commissioned by P Patrick Gaitis when he looked after the building. And this is the flat, if anybody fancies to stay in Edinburgh, it's an amazing space. Um, you can sleep underneath the painted beam ceiling. So briefly on to the Hill House. Um, it's a project that we've had a limited involvement in for a number of years now. So I'll just talk briefly about it, but I'm sure you're all familiar with Charles Eddie McIntosh's Hill House in Helensborough. It's, um, it's category A listed, arguably one of McIntosh's most important buildings. Such a special place, just incredible design. Um, the interiors, the furniture, definitely urge you to go for a visit if you have not already. There's, it, you know, it was such an innovative time, building of its time, but the external detailing has just never quite worked. Um, it's always leaked. Um, and over the years, it has just continued to deteriorate to the point that you're probably all familiar that there's been a box erected over it. Um, so this is Carmen D. Groke's box, which has been installed, which is allowing the building to really slowly dry out. Um, but it's really important that that process is monitored while, while it happens. So definitely go and visit the box if you have not already. It's just absolutely incredible. The mesh is... Um, so transparent, sparkles on a on a lovely day. It's, it's very nice. And then there's these amazing walkways. You can go right over the roof of the Hill House and see views of a building that you would normally only ever see from a scaffold with lots of PPE on. So it just feels like quite a treat. Um, so our involvement has been around survey work and technical research. So before the box was installed, we carried out a series of condition surveys in collaboration with specialists, including this rot specialist who um, they have a, a dog who's specially trained to sniff out dry rot, which I think is great. So I um, wanted to include this picture. Um, 
And we've also been working really closely with Historic Environment Scotland, who carried out a full laser scan of the building. They've carried out thermographic imaging of the building, which you can see they've sort of superimposed onto the laser scan here. They've also carried out microwave moisture monitoring. So they did all that before the box was erected. They've been back to revisit all of the data shortly after the back box was erected. And they'll be back again this year um, to revisit again so that we can monitor how the building's drying out. And we're in the very early stages of developing the next steps for the technical research part of the project. So not a huge amount to report on that right now. Just watch this space, I think. <laughs> Another project, which I will just mention briefly because I've not actually had any involvement in this project, so I certainly um, can't take any credit for it. It's another partner in the office, Dermot, who's led it. And um, it's actually my husband, Martin, who's the project architect behind it. Um, but I'll, I'll just I'll briefly run through some images because it's a really, it's a lovely project and a great example of a contemporary intervention and extending a historic building in what's a very sensitive setting. So St. John's, again, category A listed, national importance. If you're familiar with Edinburgh, it's on a really prominent corner of Princes Street and Lothian Road. And you can see the castle in the background there. Looks out onto Princes Street Gardens, really important views of it back from the gardens. Um, and it's, it's a building that, you know, like many historic buildings has continually been altered and extended over the years. So, I think this is quite interesting to show its development. So this is the blue hatch is the extent of it when it was first built in 1888. You can see the chancel that was added in 1882, the vestry and the north porch, which was added in 1916 on the hall. Then later in 1935, the chapel was added. So there's this, there's this history of additions to the, to the building. And then in 2018, LDN added another extension onto the church hall. There was also a full refurbishment of the, the terraces as well. And the blue covers all of the area that was refurbished at the upper terrace level and again at the terrace level. So you can see it was quite, quite a large project. This section shows you, you know, a section through the terraces and the extension at the end to give you an idea of the scope of what was done. And then this is a visual of the extension itself, which is, again, contemporary, clearly reads as a, a 21st century layer intervention, but is sympathetic to the historic building, follows um, the rhythm of the historic building. It's a visual of them. Um, how, how the spaces are used. And this is the view of it looking back from, from Princess Street Gardens. So a really important view because it's just really very visible. And the inter interventions internally, again, modern, this is the, the new staircase. And some views of the extension internally as well. It's a really, really special place. Really well lit, really beautiful views. So finally, I'm just going to move on to focus on to the, the Peace Hall. Um, so this is a project that we completed in 2017 in Yorkshire. So it's the Halifax Peace Hall. And it's another example of working within the sensitive context of a historic building. Um, I was project architect on this one for about four and a half years, so spent a lot of time travelling back and forth to Halifax. It was, it was a big project, it was £15 million pounds transformation. Peace Hall's Grade 1 listed, which um, by Historic England, which is the equivalent of Category A listed in Scotland, so again, it's of, of national importance. And it was built in 1779, so it's Georgian, and it was built for the sale of pieces of cloth, hence the name. It was open just once a week on a Saturday for two hours a day on market day, and it comprised of over, over 300 single trading rooms, each just nine square metres, um, each with a window and a door. So every bay that you can see there between the columns was a single trading unit. 
So there's four colonnades around a central courtyard. And you can see that while its external walls were largely blank, so they were blank for security purposes and also to allow the town to build up around it. Um, but when you enter one of its, its entrances, um, you just come across these amazing colonnades. Um, really, really quite impressive. And this is, so this is an, I'll, I'll go through some historic photos just so you can see how it's changed over time. Um, this is an image of the site before the Peace Hall was built, just before. And the site is in the centre of the fields that you see. And Peace Hall was about a quarter of the size of the entire of Halifax at the time. So that gives you like an indication of the, the ambition and the scale of what they were trying to achieve. Um, this image, I think, is from around 1860, and it shows you how the town and industry have then built up around the Peace Hall. So you can just see the Peace Hall there in the, the bottom left. Um, and you can also you can see the scale of the industry, the number of chimney stacks that are around the town as well, quite incredible. I think this painting's undated. I'm not quite sure when it's from, but um, it's of a military display. Uh, the scale and the proportions are a bit wrong as, as paintings can be, um, but it just shows you that it was a building that was always in public use. And then this is probably my favourite building um, painting of the piece. I think this one's from about 1890 and it's a Sunday school gathering. So I just absolutely, I just love, you know, how many people are there, just how well used the space must have been. However, um, there was a decline in the wool industry um, and in the 1870s, Peace Hall was converted into a wholesale market, which is what this image is here. You can see that they've started to sort of build, um, build up against the colonnades, so the heritage certainly wasn't as valued at that time. You can see also how black the stonework was from all of the pollution. Um, it did go on in 1927 to be the first commercial industrial building to be scheduled as an ancient monument. So that was that was pretty incredible. But it fell into decline again in the 20th century. And this is folk from the 70s when it went through another full refurbishment. But this time that meant a loss of a lot of the historic interiors. Um, and the stone was also shot blasted. You can see now it's not black anymore. Um, and while that was done at good faith in the time, like some of the repairs at Riddle's Court, they, it actually had been detrimental to the building and it's accelerated the, decay of, the rate of decay of the stone. So that was the 70s. But then most recently, the building had fallen into decline again. Um, when we started working on the project in around about 2010, most of the units were empty. Um, the courtyard was really underused. It was tired looking, lots of trip hazards, just didn't promote accessibility at all. Um, there was only one lift in the building, which was something that we needed to improve given the scale of it. And we needed to just prove, improve the access generally all around. So, so there'd been a real lack of investment and there was a real uncertainty about his future. The roof was in really poor condition. It was letting water in. This is one of the stone columns, which was just really deteriorating following the shot blasting in the 70s. It um, needed a lot of structural work. However, it was the last surviving of the great cloth halls in the UK, of which there'd been many, particularly in Yorkshire. And it was the only one that was left. Um, you know, so as an example, um, this is the Haddersfields Cloth Hall, which really interesting round building. And literally this was all that's left of it is fragments of it reconstructed in a park. I think though what's been really fundamental to the survival of Peace Hall has been its courtyard. Um, it's been voted one of the top 40 courtyard, 40 squares in the world. Um, it's in a book, which is alongside the likes of St. Mark's here that you see in Venice. 
So that was the aspiration. You know, you can see there's just there's so much going on here in St. Mark's. You can see there's a there's a catwalk, there's cafes, there's just so much happening in such a well-used space. Um, but what Peace Hall has that a lot of squares around the world don't have is access, public access to the upper floors. That's normally quite unusual in public squares. Um, so something else that makes it really, really quite special. So I'll, I'll talk you through the, the layouts and, and what we did to the to each level and how we reorganised the spaces. So this was the cellar level, which hadn't been occupied for a very long time. So that was fitted out into management and volunteer suite. And then there was this extension built as well. It was really important that the, there was an extension to the building because it was quite a limiting factor, these long, thin spaces, um, and it really needed that sort of supporting accommodation. This is um, what we call the arcade level, and that's where all of the cafes and the restaurants were located. So basically the sunny side of the courtyard to allow them all, all the cafes to spill out into the courtyard. Um, we also, there were three entrances originally, um, one in the centre of each of the ranges. And there was never an entrance um, in this range here, which we were never quite sure why. It might have been to do with the topography of the, the site. This was on quite a steep slope. But it was really important that we created a new fourth entrance because it was a really important link through to the, um, the railway station. So we formed a, a, new, a new fourth gateway. Um, and along here, we formed a new welcome hub and exhibition space so that people could come and actually learn about the building as well. And a, a link through to the new um, theatre building, Square Chapel, that was getting constructed at the same time as the Peace Hall Transformation Project as well. So where there were buildings that we could link to, we did. Um, and we also, um, I'm not going to talk about this, this is definitely for another talk, but we built a new library um, against the Peace Hall as well. It was an £8 million pound library, quite a, a big project. And um there was access through to that from the new fourth gateway. The next level, which was the colonnade level, so that was, um, sorry, this is the rustic level, mostly retail units. Um, and also there was one surviving original unit which had historic fabric in it. So that was a sort of interpretation space. And then the upper level, the colonnade levels, mix of offices and retail, um, conference suite in the extension. And then again, links through to other buildings. This is a link to the Orange Box building, which is a young person centre, a really huge and really impressive young person centre. Um, and a really interesting space above the west entrance way as well, which was another interpretation space. This is a section through the building, so you can see that um, we, we installed new structure throughout um, because the building was, was suffering structurally, but also to allow us to open up some of the more of the spaces. Building was resurfaced entirely again. This time we installed, because there was very limited um, original fabric internally, we installed new ceilings and the building was serviced through all of the new ceilings. And of course, we upgraded the building with insulation where we could walls, floors, ceilings. We carried out a meticulous package of fabric repairs, um, really detailed drawings on all of the repairs for the colonnades. I think I spent probably the first three months of the contract a variety of mobile access platforms with the stonemason looking at probably just about every stone on the building. Visited quarries to try and find the most appropriate match for replacing the stone, be it make sure it was a good petrographic match, good visual match as well. There were roof stone roof tiles which we needed to replace, different type of stone again, and then entire columns which needed to be replaced. And it's really difficult to source stone in, in that, that length and that size. Um, so there was a lot of research went into making sure that we had the right materials. 
Um, and then moving on to the courtyard. So we worked with the landscape architects, Gillespie's, um, and the the slope which you saw before, it was quite a steep slope across the site. It, it fell by about two metres, um, really uneven surface, lots of trip hazards. It wasn't even historic. It was installed around about the 70s, we think. Um, so the intention with the redesign of the, the courtyard was to create a new attractive, accessible event space that could be really well used by the town as a new town square. Um, so the idea was that we would create level access all around the perimeter of the courtyard. So you could easily get all around and into all of the spaces and then ramped and stepped access at both ends into a big central event space with smaller central, smaller events spaces at each corners and water features as well, just to add a little fun. Um, we, we chose a mixture of materials, generally sort of contemporary materials that complemented the, the historic fabric, but you know, the new courtyard is a clearly a modern intervention. We're not even quite sure what it would have been like originally. Um, and these are some, some images of it completed. And lighting was really important. Um, so we worked with the lighting designers at Bureau Happold and they actually won an award for, for their lighting design. We didn't want to just floodlit the building, you know, we, we needed to light it sensitively and um, it, it, it was going to be open much longer hours than it normally was before as well. So lighting was, was absolutely crucial. And we carried out um, quite an extensive mock-up before we went to site to make sure that we'd got the lighting right, which was which was brilliant. Um, and you can see that they, they went for a light every other column um, and then also lights um, following the grid within the courtyard as well. So I think everyone was really pleased with, with how the lighting design turned out. This is a nighttime view. You can see the that was the new extension and then that's the library that was built again as well. And the new exhibition space. So now when um, when visitors come to the building, they can they can learn about its history, which there was there wasn't any of that before, and can really engage with it. And it's the you know the transformation. It, it's been a, a real success. Um, they welcomed over twenty two thousand visitors on opening day, um, and we we're really proud that it went on to win four Reba awards, and overall UK winner at the Heritage Angel Awards as well. Um, there was an independent report commissioned and it stated that two years after it opened, it had boosted the local economy by 26 million. Um, and Historic England stated that it was one of the most successful renewal projects of its time. So it's, it's something we're, we're, we're really proud of and we're just so delighted that the space has been so well used again. It's had, it's had over 5 million visitors um, since it first opened, it's had major events like the Tour de Yorkshire, which you can see here, BBC Antiques Roadshow. Um, uh, what I love about this image is that it, it it goes back to some of the, it reminds me of some of the historic images, you know, when the building was just flooded with people in the courtyard and the colonnades and, you know, just being used as it should be. And, I, you know, just most importantly for us, it's been a catalyst for the regeneration of, of Halifax. Um, and that the, the town have really taken ownership of the building again. I think I think that must be about time now. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna finish up here. But um, thank you everyone so much for your time and for listening and um, welcome any questions. Yeah, that was that was great, Emma. Thank you for that. Could you please stop sharing your screen? And we'll yeah, sure. I take some questions. So we already had one question come in um, just there from Stephen asking, can you describe the decision making process you used at Riddles Court to arrive at leaving unfinished or very discovered featured layers in the lift lobby? I've always wondered about how the chosen approach would be viewed by future generations. Was there 
another approach that still respected the archaeology that was uncovered and recorded. I have sympathy with what was done, but it would be interesting to understand what other options were considered. Hi, Stephen. I hope you're well. Thanks for the question. It's a good one. <laughs> um, I think that it was it was absolutely crucial that we provided access to this building for the first time, and um, we did look really carefully at where the least significant part of the building was that we could that we could make this insertion all the way through, um, and in terms of how the fabric was left. It was is literally how the fabric's been cut away. So where partitions have been cut away, where stairs have been cut away, um, to form this void, they've just they've been left. Um, they've been left as sort of records in the fabric, if you like. In terms of archaeology, so there was a well, there's been work published on it actually. There's been a really impressive um, historic building analysis carried out, um, and. That was all commissioned well before the work started on site, which helped to inform our design, of course, helped us to understand what the most significant spaces were, how the building had developed over time. Um, and everything was recorded before anything was taken away. Does that, have I answered the question? I hope so. <laughs> yeah, I have a question as well. I was wondering, um... We talked a lot about researching the projects and history and the heritage behind that. How long do you typically spend um, researching projects and do those, does that history always kind of inform decisions or change sort of ideas that you may have had at the start? Does the project always kind of involve, uh, evolve throughout? It does, yeah, because, you know, as much research, you can spend as much research time re researching at, at the beginning and things inevitably can appear um, as as the project goes on, especially if there's been some press about the project. Quite often people will start to speak about it or they'll find something, you know, um, that, that they've got. Um, so it, it can vary. I mean, we try to do as much research as we possibly can, but it's all about how much information is actually out there because, you can check every archive there is and, you know, try and follow every lead that you can. And there might just not be a lot on a, on a building. And that, that's sometimes the case. And visits to archives can sometimes be really disappointing. And you can come back a little bit gutted because you didn't find what you were hoping to. Um, but other projects, like the Hill House, for example, the... Um, Wow, the NTS have the most incredible archive. I've spent days <laughs> going through all of the Hill House information um, and trying to like tease out what's important, what we need to know, trying to um, make sure that it's in a way that I can pass it on to others who are going to need it as well. So it really can vary so much, but the more you know about the building at the beginning, the better, without a doubt, because it's so crucial in helping you making decisions as to where you're going to make change. And change is often inevitable for these buildings. Um, and you can only make that change by having a really good understanding of how it's developed and what's significant. Yeah, definitely. Um, a few more questions came in. Um, well, Christina, thanks, Emma. Such an interesting presentation. What are your thoughts on important heritage buildings in terms of the climate emergency and Scotland's carbon targets? Thanks, Christina. That's, that's another good question. Um, I mean, it is absolutely crucial that we improve our historic buildings as best we can. Um, there are so many of them and they're going to be around for a lot longer. Um, it's difficult though. It's really, really challenging. There's so many simple things that you can do though, like ensure your building is well maintained. Goodness me, that makes such a difference. Increase the size of your rainwater goods for increased rainfall. But when it comes to things like upgrading, installing insulation, it needs to be done properly. You know, spaces need to be well ventilated and it, it needs to be done by somebody that has an understanding of the heritage as well. So I think it's it's absolutely crucial that our buildings are upgraded as best we can without 
harming the heritage, but it's also really important that the work is done by somebody who has a good understanding of the heritage as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, Stephen's uh, replied back, follow up remark on your response. Is it not a bit like the surgeon leaving the opening he made? I guess it is a little, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It is a little. I mean, the alternative would have been to repair it all. Um, but what you would have been doing is you wouldn't have been putting back as it would have been originally. So it could have been considered a bit superficial. But there's so many different ways of viewing these things, Stephen. Yeah, definitely. There's so many, there's so many layers when you go through these projects. Yeah, yeah, of course. You said you, you find lots of new things. Um, there was a learning process. Um, what percentage of your firm's work is heritage or modern additions to heritage buildings? Oh, no, I don't know the answer to that. I'd say like 100% of my work generally, <laughs> um, not always, but most of the time. Um, we're quite often doing work which um, is maybe new build, but within the context of a sensitive historic setting as well. Um, but we we do do a lot of new build work as well. Um, one of my business partners is Passive House Accredited as well. That's a, a focus at the moment. Um, so it, it's a real mix, but certainly my interests lie with the historic buildings personally. Yeah, a few questions. Um, you talked a bit about the courtyard space at Halifax Project. And what do you think can make a really positive, like well used, um, used courtyard space like that? Because you see there's lots of activity in that area and it's a real hub for um, the community there. But I think, first of all, it needs to be accessible. And, you know, everybody needs to be able to access the space, whether, you know, you've got a pram or you're in a wheelchair or you're just, you know, maybe not quite as able as others. So it it needs to be fully accessible. That's just so crucial. Um, it's something we've just done recently at the courtyard at the Stables Block in New Hills. Um, we'll be doing it at the courtyard in Proven Hall as well. Um, so it needs to be a space that everyone can enjoy. It needs to be a space that's well serviced um, for events. So at Peace Hall, there are a series of um, pop-ups around the courtyard so that um, there's power, there's water supply. So whoever comes in is really quite flexible and flex flexibility is quite crucial. The last thing you want is lots of cables everywhere and um, trip hazards. And so that's been quite important. We've, we've installed a pop-up at New Hills and there'll be some going in at Proven Hall as well. Um, so I think accessibility and flexibility in terms of servicing are, are really important. And then that connection back to the building as well and how it, how it relates to the spaces um, around it is, is also really important. Yeah, I've got another few questions, this one from Heather. Uh, do you work with contractors that are also well-versed in historic buildings? What are the problems faced when on site? And looking to serve or celebrate historic aspects of buildings such as keeping some elements found as found. So um do we work with contractors well versed in historic buildings? We certainly try our best to. Um, and yeah, there, there's obviously there's some great contractors around who are, are well experienced. There's some great stonemasons. Um, it's really important that you work with the right contractor and that they have an understanding of working with historic buildings. Um, procurement doesn't always allow it, um, that you can come across challenges with that. Um, so yeah, the answer is yeah, as best we can. Um, in terms of problems faced on site when trying to preserve aspects of the building, such as keeping some elements as found. So, well, one of the big challenges is, is is normally to do with budget because you can find um, something really interesting, but you just don't have the money to do anything with it. Um, and these historic building projects are often very limited on budget because they've had to get funding from all sorts of various places. And, you know, the budget is the budget and there's just not much more to spend. 
Um, so quite often you'll find something and it will just need to be closed up for future generations because there's just no money to do anything with it. Um, for example, there was the, the painted bean ceiling at Riddles Court that while um, we were able to expose it, we, we weren't able to um, restore it at this date. But the important thing is that the, the client knows it's there and they know they can go back to it in the future. Um, so I think that's that's probably one of the key issues. I mean, sometimes you come across, um, sometimes you get really lucky. We um, There's a project we're working on in the borders just now. My colleague Alice is the, the project architect on it. And um, the, we found a, a section of an old staircase just a few weeks ago that um, we didn't think was there. Um, so we're absolutely delighted to find it. And Alice has worked really hard to change the design to keep it. And actually it's... Um, it's, it's resulted in a much better design and the fire escape strategy has been able to improve out of it. So sometimes you get really lucky. <laughs> um, just not always. <laughs> yeah, I can see my questions in. Uh, do, you, do you ever come across difficulties in finding crafts people? Yeah, well, absolutely. Um, there's a lot of um, trades out there which are just, there's... I mean, there's there's only a handful of people in the whole of Scotland that will do like lime plaster repairs. Um, so it, yeah, it can be really difficult, and you do find that there tends to be the same specialists that you work with again and again because they can do the work. Um, we do a lot of work in England as well, and again, it's a different sort of range of specialists we tend to work with down there, or some are working across the whole country, but. It's really, it's really important, Finlay, that um, traditional skills are promoted because um, they're so crucial in maintaining these buildings. And, you know, going back to Christina's question about like looking after the heritage and um, in terms of the future and climate emergency, it's so important that these buildings are repaired using traditional materials, you know, lime, stone, slate, lead, um, and these are we've got skills shortages of all of these um, of all of these skills, and using other materials which we maybe thought were great at the time have proven to be detrimental, like the cement render at um, Riddles Court, like the shot blasting at the Peace Hall. So all you know done in good faith at the time, but actually really we should have just been using traditional skills and materials. Um, so it's really, it's, it's so crucial in maintaining our buildings going forward, but there's a real, um, there is a real lack in the industry. And that's why I always really enjoy it when our projects involve community engagement, reaching out to the younger generation, getting them involved in that kind of thing, making them appreciate it. Yeah, definitely. A um, few more questions. Services have changed markedly through the years. What provision is made for the installation of new services in the future? I don't think I can see that question, but um, um, the provision for new services in the future. Yeah, what, what provision is made for the installation of new services in the future? Well, we, I mean, we always try and future-proof as much as we possibly can. It can be really challenging. Um, so it really it depends on, on the building, um, the space that's available. There's not always a lot of space available for these things. Um, but certainly, you know, there's, there's, cer there's certainly, you know, everyone's gearing towards electricity at the moment so that in the future they can look at renewables. If they can't look at them now, they're, they're certainly planning for them. Um, so there's there's a there's a limit to what future proofing you can do sometimes, but it's it's certainly something that we do try to do. Um, I have a question about a uh, technology. You mentioned quite a few different um, sort of uh, things that you go through and use, and hopefully laser scanning, thermal imagery. How crucial is the technology now um, to the heritage work that you? undertake oh, it's really important um, and what historic environment scotland have been doing in, at the hill house is, has been so crucial to understanding you know the future of the building because they, they needed to do all of this survey work before the box went up so that they had a benchmark so that they can 
see how the building is, is drying out. And it, it's really important that a building dries out quite slowly as well. Um, and you also get to quite a, there can be a point where dry rot outbreaks can happen. So it's just, it's so important that it's monitored. Um, and the monitoring can help you make decisions going forward. Um, we, you know, we're really lucky at the Hill House that HES have, have taken this involvement um, and are doing so much monitoring on it because not, not a lot of buildings get the same level of um, care and attention, but obviously is such a significant building for Scotland and absolutely deserves it. Yeah, I um, visited it quite recently with my family and it was really interesting with the box because you can just um, walk around and walk over the roof line and things. It's really, it's you amazing. see all the other bits that you would you would have so so easily missed. Yeah, yeah. No, it's absolutely fascinating. Yeah, last call for any um, questions. Um, I think we'll have any more, but that was that was great, Emma. Thank you for coming on today and giving us your time. You're hey, very welcome. Thank you, thank you for having me. Okay.